So as this year draws to a close, I thought it'd be interesting to do a video where I talk about some of the things that I read this year that had the biggest impact on me. The channel isn't even a year old yet, and it's been exciting to see it grow, and hopefully I'm going to be doing this for a number of years, so I thought it would be nice to have a way to look back and look at the journey that we've been making on the channel throughout the year. And I even chose kind of the random number for that BuzzFeed clickbait effect. I mean, I was a journalist, right? You gotta do the headline thing. So that said, here are the nine things I read in 2020 that impacted me the most. Number one, Curtis Yarvin, Unqualified Reservations. Yeah, believe it or not, I had not read anything by Moldbug before the beginning of this year. I had heard of him through The Distributist, but I had not actually read anything until I think about February of this year. Kind of as we were really starting to see the COVID stuff flare up, that's when I actually started reading Unqualified Reservations for the first time. I guess I'm kind of cheating by including the whole blog on this entry, but I think you can probably understand after watching the content on my channel. I'm not going to spend a ton of time going on about why Curtis Yarvin's stuff was important for me to read this year, but obviously it sent me pretty far down the rabbit hole and I probably wouldn't be reading most of what I've read this year or recording things and putting them onto YouTube if I hadn't read Unqualified Reservations. Obviously, if you haven't, you really should be reading it. Grey Mirror is great, you should definitely read that too, but if you're going to start anywhere, I would start in Unqualified Reservations. That's where most of the really important stuff is. Number two, Nick Land, The Dark Enlightenment. Nick Land is someone who's pretty essential to neo-reactionary stuff, but I haven't spent a ton of time talking about him on the channel this year. That is something that I do want to remedy going into next year, but one of the reasons I haven't gotten into some of his stuff is a decent amount of it is kind of impenetrable. But the good news is that The Dark Enlightenment is not like that. It's very different. It's much more readable, and it's also drafting directly off of Moldbug. It's pulling a lot of its concepts from Moldbug's work. So if you are familiar with Unqualified Reservations, you will find the Dark Enlightenment much more accessible. It serves as a great companion volume to Yarvin's work, filling in a lot of the gaps and also going into some much more interesting places, especially when it touches on things like social dynamics and the structure of cities and these kind of things. So hopefully I'm looking to read more Nick Land this year, but if you want to get started anywhere, I highly recommend the Dark Enlightenment. Number three, James Burnham, The Machiavellians. I read a number of James Burnham books this year, and I really recommend all of them, but if you have to pick one book, it's absolutely The Machiavellians. It's very clear that Moldbug was heavily influenced by Burnham. His fingerprints are all over Yarvin's work. Burnham is really excellent at explaining how power works. It's very direct, it doesn't pull any punches, and even though the book is over 50 years old, it truly understands some very important human dynamics when it comes to understanding political power. As the title implies, Burnham is himself drawing from some much older sources like Machiavelli and Prato. But he does an excellent job of pulling the most important parts of their work forward, updating them, and synthesizing them into something both very useful and very approachable. So if you want to understand where the power analysis side of neo-reactionary thinking started, James Burnham and the Machiavellians is a great place to go. Number four, Thomas Carlyle, Latter-day Pamphlets. Carlyle is someone who Yarvin really, really recommends. He spent an entire long three-part essay explaining the importance of Thomas Carlyle, so he's clearly a big fan. And after reading some Thomas Carlyle, I can definitely see why. Carlyle is a fierce critic of democracy, liberalism, and modernity. In latter-day pamphlets, he is particularly eloquent when talking about how terrible it is that modern life is reducing the complex and mysterious and wonderful universe down into spreadsheets and mechanisms and science. 
Carlisle can be a bit of an acquired taste as you first get started. He kind of writes like the world's most eloquent, angry grandpa yelling at you to get off his lawn. But the more I read it, the more I liked it. And honestly, I think it's some of the most compelling stuff I've read on the subject all year. If Burnham is kind of the dry, analytical inspiration for Yarvin, Carlyle is definitely the heart and the soul. I've got a couple more books of his lined up in the queue, and I'm definitely looking forward to getting to them. Number 5, Joseph de Maestra, On Sovereignty. I ended up reading a lot more of de Maestra than I expected to this year, and his essay On Sovereignty is definitely a great place to start, and you can find it online for free. De Maestra is another fierce critic of democracy and liberalism, who regularly makes predictions that absolutely came true, even though he's writing in like the early 1800s. He does a great job in explaining the concept of sovereignty, and why attempts to restrain it generally end up not only failing, but ultimately hurting the people who attempt to do so. He also makes a very valuable and very powerful case against putting a high degree of trust in written constitutions. And if you're a Christian, there's also a lot of great stuff in there for you as well. Demaestra's very religious and weaves it heavily into his explanations on power, sovereignty, and all the other things that he discusses. Number six... Carl Schmitt, The Concept of the Political. Carl Schmitt might be the most brutally direct attacker of liberalism that I read this year. He goes directly at it and dismantles it, treating it as an overly complicated obfuscation of the way power actually works. He also has a very fascinating way of explaining what politics is and where the political comes from, and of course explains the absolutely essential concept of the friend-enemy distinction. Concept of the political is a very quick read, and I would say probably is the most pound-for-pound valuable thing I read this year. Number 7, Christopher Lash, Revolt of the Elites. Revolt of the Elites is an amazing prophecy straight out of 1995. Lash does a phenomenal job of predicting where our professional managerial class would take us. He foresees the creation of a global elite culture where elites move beyond their own country and its interests and instead relate more to those of their class across the entire globe. It does a very good job of providing a class analysis from a more right-wing perspective, and it's something that will definitely broaden your horizons. Number 8. Patrick Deneen. Why Liberalism Failed. This is definitely the most accessible and normie-friendly thing I'm going to be suggesting on this list. This is probably the critique of liberalism you'll want to hand to your church-going parents. It probably does the best job of laying out an accessible moral case against liberalism, but it also manages to not pull its punches. Despite being more mainstream, there is a lot of really good reactionary meat in this thing. And Deneen is more than happy to go after both the more traditional GOP and Democratic versions of liberalism. Again, something I highly recommend if you kind of want to prime the pump for a family member who you think might be moving this direction. Number 9. Christopher Caldwell, Age of Entitlement. Age of Entitlement does a great job of tracing the narrative thread through the history of the civil rights movement, feminism, and LGBT movements since the 1950s. It really does a good job of showing the bait-and-switch mechanism used by most of these movements to sell them to the American people, and how they preyed on the goodwill of most of the populace in order to usher in changes that they didn't really want, and ended up using them to scale back the rights of the average American. This is another one of those accessible and more modern mainstream books, which would make a good on-ramp for someone who you want to introduce to these concepts. Alright guys, so those are my top 9 most impactful things I read in 2020. If you like the ideas that I've been exploring on the channel, now you know some of the books and blogs and essays they've been coming from, so you can go out and do some of the reading for yourself if you want to know more. Again, the channel isn't even a year old yet, and I've been really excited to see everybody who's been watching the videos, subscribing, coming out to watch the live streams. It's been great. I've met a lot of very interesting people, and I have a hobby doing something that I really enjoy. 
I hope you guys have a great Christmas season, and I look forward to seeing where the channel goes in 2021. As always guys, if you like the video, please go ahead and hit like. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's a great time to do so. If you want to follow me on Twitter or you want to support my work on Subscribestar like Nick J or Count Elmsley do, the links you need to follow are in the description below the video. If you'd like to pick up a mug or a sticker to support the channel, you can follow the link to the merch store. And I also suggest that you go ahead and subscribe to my Rumble channel in case anything ever happens here on YouTube, you'll be able to find me there. I want to thank everybody again for sharing the channel out and helping it grow. And as always, I'll talk to you next time.